All right, you ready? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So today we're doing graphs of derivatives. So mainly we'll do f prime graphs, but I think we will probably look at at least a derivative or two, or a second derivative or two. So if your f is going uphill, or increasing, that tells you f prime is positive. If f is decreasing, that tells you that f prime is negative. If f is concave up, the second derivative is positive, which should be a little bit lower. And if it, f is concave down, then the second derivative is negative. Now, there's one more relationship between those. If your f is concave up, not only is f double prime positive, but because that's the slope of f prime, that means that f prime would be increasing. So these three things all kind of coincide. But if your f is concave up, your f prime would be going uphill, and your f double prime would be positive. Same thing for f concave down, your f double prime is negative and your f prime would have a negative slope to get you to the second derivative. Okay, so if you're looking at the graph below, okay, this is a graph of f prime of x, but then they're gonna ask you a bunch of questions about the graph of f that you don't have. So first thing that I would pretty much always do is find your critical numbers. Okay, remember that critical numbers are going to be anywhere that f prime of x equals zero. And so since this is f prime of x, those are just going to be like your zeros on the graph. So like the x-intercepts. The x-intercepts. You'll have negative five, negative one, and positive five. Okay, then out of those three, we're looking at the sign changes. Hey, Daniel. Right. So for the first one, your f prime changes from positive numbers to negative numbers. So that's going to make it a max. Hey, what about negative one? What would negative one be? Min, because it goes from negatives to positives. We just barely started, so you're fine. And then for the last one at five, it goes from positives. It kind of bounces on the x-axis, but then it stays positive. So remember that that would be a neither. Um, and you could also call that a horizontal tangent because essentially what would happen is your graph would be increasing. It would flatten out when it hits zero, but then it would keep increasing. So a horizontal tangent would look kind of like that, where it like gets flat, like it's about to turn around, but then it doesn't. Okay, so that being said, it says find your relative max. So we would say X equals negative five. We have a relative max because the graph of f prime changes from plus to minus, plus to minus. Oh, dang it, I wrote them in the wrong spot, but oh well, it's fine, we'll just put them there. Okay, part B was asking for the max, part A was asking for the min, so then we'll just put it right below. Okay, our min was at negative one, and then the only thing that would really change would be instead of saying it goes from plus to minus for a max, it'd be minus to plus for a min. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, one more part like that. Okay, it says find all the values where the second derivative is less than zero. Okay, so think about if the original graph is f prime then f double prime is one derivative into the graph. So what feature would that be? Yeah, so f double prime would be what feature if f prime of x is the y values? It'd be concavity on f, it'll be slope for f prime, very good. So I'm gonna put right below there, f double prime of x is gonna be the slope of your f prime graph. And it should kind of make sense because if you think about how do I go from f to f prime, it's just one derivative that's the slope. Yep. Okay, 
So then we're looking for F double prime to be less than zero, which means negative. So then our negative slopes are where? There are two of them. Uh, negative seven to negative three. Yes, and then? That's two to like five. Two to five, very good. Now there's one important thing that happens at three. So let's write that answer down the way that you said it. So negative seven to negative three union. And then from two to five. Okay, that second interval would actually be wrong. And here's the reason why. As you trace down that section of the graph, okay, so just look kind of carefully at this. It's downhill, 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 but then what happens right here? Not horizontal, but vertical. And if it's vertical, does it have a negative slope or does it have an undefined slope? Undefined. So you'd actually have to break that one chunk up here to be two to three and then three to five. Because technically at three, you don't have a slope, well then it can't be negative, okay? So I'm gonna break this second one up to be two to three and then three to five. Okay, you do not have to break up if it's a horizontal slope, but you do if it's vertical. Okay, good on that, any questions? All right, let's look at the next one. <laughs> Um, all right, next one, we have a graph, okay, and then what it says right here is kind of important, okay, so it says this is F prime, we have horizontal tangents at negative one, one and three, so I see that it goes kind of flat, flat, and flat, okay, and then it says right here, the area of the regions bounded by the x-axis in the graph for negative two, one and one, four are nine and 12. So let's just put those area numbers into the graph. So from negative two, one, my area is gonna be nine. And then from one to four, my area is gonna be 12. Okay, part A says find all X coordinates where we have a relative max. Okay, now notice we want F to have a relative max, but this is an F. So I can't just find the high spot. I have to think about if I want F to have a max, then I want F prime of X so to equal. Go ahead. It'll have to equal zero and then change signs how. Oh yeah. So then if I want F to have a max, I'm gonna find the critical numbers at the zero which would be here, here, and here. And then out of those three, which one is a max? One is a max on F prime, but for a max on F, we want F prime to change sign from oh, so plus to minus, so it'd be negative two. And then what would one be? Uh, no. Yeah, it'd be a neither. Because it goes from negative to negative. So if you think about what that would look like, it'd go downhill, it'd flatten out, and then it'd keep going downhill. So yeah, it'd be a horizontal tangent, but not a min or a max. So let's write that out. We'd say x equals negative two. We have a relative max because f prime of x, that's the graph we're looking at, changes plus to minus. Okay, but notice it's not a, ma a max on this graph. It's a max on the graph that we don't have. Um, okay, second part of this. Um, uh, let's, we'll come back to that part in a second. Okay, part B says, when would the graph be concave down and decreasing? Okay, so they're actually giving you two things here. For F to be concave down, what derivative would I care about? First or second? Second. Okay, the second derivative has to be negative. And in this graph, what will the second derivative be? What feature? Um, slope. The slope. So the slope of F prime graph will have to be negative. Okay, then the second thing I'm looking for is F doesn't just have to be concave down. It also has to be decreasing. So if F is decreasing, what does that tell us? 
right of C. Okay, on the original graph of F, it would have a negative slope, but what would my F be? F prime would have to be negative. And then remember that F prime is this graph, right? So if I want this graph to be negative, then I just want it to be below the X axis. And like in the negatives, X axis. So for F to be decreasing, you're right, it has to have a negative slope, but I don't have that graph to look at. So if I'm looking at F prime, I would have to look for the pockets that are below the X axis and that have a slope of F prime that's negative. So where is it below the x-axis and it has a negative slope on the graph that we have? Or from two. So one to four, it's underneath, but how much of that is also downhill? Oh, just one to three. One to three. And then there's one more part, where is it? Negative two to negative one. Negative two to negative. So it'd be negative two to negative one, union one to three. Negative two, negative one, union one, two, three. Okay. Uh, next part says to find points of inflection. Okay, so go back to your definition. Points of inflection are when the concavity changes, but on this graph, what's concavity gonna be? It'll be the slope. So if I want points of inflection is when the concavity changes, concavity changes, then really I want the slope to change sign. Okay. So then looking at this graph, where are your slope changes? Um. Yes, and? One. Yes, and three. Very good. Okay, so it's downhill until negative one, uphill till one, and then downhill till three, and then uphill after that. So it'd be x equals <laughs> negative one, one, and three. And then you would just say because f double prime, the slope in the f prime graph changes sign. Okay, you could not say the concavity changes because that's not what we were actually looking for on this graph since we didn't have the actual picture of that. Does that make sense? Okay, turn the page. So now we're gonna apply a little bit of particle motion to it. So instead of looking at a graph of F prime, we're gonna look at a graph of velocity. Okay, but keep in mind that in the sequence, okay, position, velocity, and acceleration, okay, velocity basically is an F prime graph. K versus position would be your original f of x. And then acceleration would basically be your f prime. So looking at the graph, it says find the time and position of the particle when it's farthest to the left. Well, then the first thing we're going to have to do is find our critical numbers, which are going to be where the graph is at rest. Okay, and remember, at rest is when your f prime equals zero. Okay, but in this case, F prime is velocity. So if I want it to not be moving, the velocity has to be zero. Where does that happen? Uh, where is your velocity graph equal to zero? What uh, numbers? And? Zero. And zero. Okay, so then we would say it's at rest at zero, three, and five. Okay, what type is three, a min or a max? Okay, let's look at how it passes through. The graph was below, which means that it was decreasing. And then it switches to above, which means increasing. So if it goes decreasing to increasing, is that a min or a max? It's a min. Okay, versus for five, look at the direction of the sign chain. It goes from positives down into the negatives, which means positive slope into a negative slope would be a max, very good. Okay, 
So it says find the time and position of the particle when it is farthest to the left. So let's start off by saying that this is the relative max. Uh, let's put t equals five is a relative max because v of t changes sign from plus to minus. Okay, but then they don't ask you where there's a relative max. They say farthest to the left. Okay, so the difference is that farthest to the left means absolute max. And do you remember um, in yesterday's session, Luke, what did we have to do when it was an absolute max? Um, Not a derivative. We had to make a candidate chart. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. So you'll set up your little chart here. Okay, only two things have to go into a candidate's chart. Say that again. Mins and maxes and endpoints. Don't forget endpoints. So my endpoints are going to be zero and six. And now technically, I do have a min and a max, but if I'm wanting farthest to the left, which type am I actually looking for? So I'm going to change this to actually say min because I read it wrong. Okay, it really should be an absolute min, which means is three going to make it into my chart if it's a maximum value? Mm -hmm. Three will make it in there, but will five? In between, yeah. Sure. Okay. So from here, look back in the question. Okay, velocity can tell you how far the particle moved, but it can't actually tell you position. They have to give you position somewhere. So do you see at the very end of this that it tells you the starting position? Okay, so it says at time zero, what's the particle's position? Negative two. Negative two. Okay, then from zero to three, I accumulate all of this area, which is negative. Then from three to five, I go forward. Then from five to six, I go backwards. If these were geometric shapes, you'd find the area yourself. But since they're just kind of little humpy shapes, they have to give it to you. So let's read again what it says. Okay, the areas of the regions bounded by the t-axis and the graph of v are eight, three, and two. So this one's eight, this one's three, this one's two. So if my particle started at a position of negative two, and in the first three seconds, it went eight backwards, what would its position be by time three? It's gonna go backwards eight. Uh, so negative, 10. negative 10 is correct. Okay, then from three to five seconds, it accumulates some positive distance. It went forward three. Where would it be at by the time it hits five? <coughs> uh, negative seven is correct. Yeah. And then for your last two, they're backwards because it's below, so it'd be negative nine. Then out of all of those numbers, which position would be farthest to the left? We're looking for the absolute min. Which uh, position is farthest to the left on the number line? Negative 10. Negative 10. So you'd say the farthest to the left is, farthest left is negative 10, and it occurs at time three. Okay, and then notice on this AP question, they ask you for both. So you can't just say it's negative 10. You can't just say it's three. It says, when is it and what is the position? So the time and the position. Um, okay, next one says, how many values is the particle of the position negative eight? So let's count. So if I started at negative two and then I went backwards to negative 10, would I have hit negative eight? Okay, so think about your numbers in the chart. If my position goes from negative two to negative 10, would I have had to hit a position of negative eight between those? Yes. Yes, yes because where's negative eight? In between. In between. That's intermediate value. Again. Okay, next one, from negative 10 to negative seven, would I have had to hit negative eight again? Yes. And what about negative seven down to negative nine? Yes. So then you're guaranteed that it had to hit it three times. Okay, so it says, for how many values is the particle blah, blah, blah? you would say at least three times. 
because, okay, and then we're going to have to use IVT. So remember your conditions for IVT, your function has to be continuous. Now, if they say it's differentiable, does that also guarantee you that it's smooth? Yes. So I'm going to put for step number one, okay, V of T is continuous. How do I know? Because it's differentiable. Okay, and if it's differentiable, continuity is required. Okay, then in step number two, I'm going to have to show that the y value that I want is between several of those different intervals. So for step number two, I'm going to put it over here. I'm going to put negative eight is between position at zero and position at three and position of three and five and position at five and six. And then pretty much after that, you can put, just put therefore IVT guarantees this. Okay, so as long as the number you want is between the endpoints, you're not allowed to skip it if your function's continuous. Okay, and there might have been a shorter way to say that, but you know what I mean. So I would have had to hit negative eight three times because I'd hit it going down to negative 10, up to negative seven, and then a third time going back to negative nine. Okay, uh, next part of this, speed. Okay, remember that speed is gonna be increasing when V and A have the same sign. Okay, and then likewise, it'll be decreasing if they're opposite signs. So look back up at your graph. We're looking at a velocity graph. What feature will acceleration be in the velocity graph? Um, so it's the second derivative of position, but I don't have the position graph. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's just slope. So it's going to be the slope. Very good. So your V of T is going to be the Y value being above or below. And your A of T is going to be the slope of the velocity graph. And I want them to be the same sign. So there are two options for that. If my Y value is positive, I'm above, then what kind of slope do I want? Um, positive. Also positive. Versus what if my y values are below? Then what would my slope would need to be negative? So look at your graph for when it's above with a positive slope, where does that happen? Um, just three to five. Uh, not three to five, three till four. Four, because I have to have a positive slope to match. So three to four is going to be one of them. Okay. Uh, then when am I below with a negative slope? Five to six. Five to six and zero to one. Five to six and zero to one. Very good. Okay. And then uh, since it says to give a reason, I would just put because V of T and A of T have the same sign. Um, last part of this, it says, when is the acceleration negative? What feature did we say acceleration is on the velocity graph? What feature will acceleration be? Uh huh, very good. So that's going to be the slope on the V of T graph. And so if I want acceleration to be negative, then I'm just looking for the slope to be negative. And where does that happen? Negative slope. Yeah, where do I have a negative slope? Uh, zero to one. Zero to one. And then it's uphill all the way until where? Um, four to five. Mm -hmm. Four, and then it's going to stay negative or downhill all the way till six. Because even though it goes through the x axis, we're just looking at your slope overall. Does that make sense? Okay, then when it says justify, you put because acceleration, the slope on the velocity graph is negative. Okay. 
Um, and then quick question. I always have sometimes a few kids that phrase this differently. I can say the slope of velocity is negative. Could I also say though velocity is decreasing? That's the same thing. So if you like that better, use that. All good on that? All right, let's see. All right, so then we're gonna do a little bit of calculator stuff. Um, so for number one, they already give you F prime. So all that you need to do is look at the graph in the calculator and then we'll answer the questions from there. Here we go. Thank you. Okay, so go ahead and type that in. Also, do I need to take the derivative for that question? No, because they already gave you that prime. So we're typing that equation in here. E to the x minus 3x squared. Okay, then hit graph. And it says, for what values uh, do we have a relative max? Now, remember, this isn't f, so I'm not looking for the high point. This is f prime. Then I'm looking for an x-intercept. <laughs> um, which x-intercept am I looking for? First, second, or third? Positive one being two of them are positive. Which one? The first one or the second one? The second one. Okay, so let's check your signs. Negative to positive. Is that a max or a min? <laughs> That's a min. Then it'd have to be the first one. And how does the slope change on the first one? From plus negative. to minus, that's a max. Okay, so then let's review how to find that in your calculator. So you're going to hit second trace. You'll do uh, option zero is number two. And then uh, you need to go a little bit above and then a little bit below and then back to the middle. Now, did you say intersection, Luke? Yeah, intersection. Okay, you could do, a lot of teachers actually teach it that way. If you want to do an intersection, what would you let your y2 be? Just whatever the... Make it, no, zero. Yeah? So if you like that better, a lot of kids actually do that instead. I'm not sure who teaches it like that, but that's also right. But if you want to let your y2 just be the number zero, then you can find where they cross, which everybody pretty much already knows how to do. So you just hit first curve, second curve, and then make sure you're close to it on the guess. So I got 0 0.910, which is gonna be answer C. Remember on the AP test, they'll go now, the rule is three decimals rounded correctly, or four, you could just, whatever your fourth digit is, doesn't matter. Okay, next one, are we taking the derivative? No. No. Okay, it says we want points of inflection. So let's type it in, take a look at the graph. Also, do we remember how to restrict our domain? Okay, so let's uh, look at that. So it's gonna be sine x cubed. And then we're gonna hit window. And then the negative 1.8 to 1.8 should be your x min and your x max. And especially with the trig ones, they can look really crazy if you don't restrict your window. So negative 1.8 to positive 1.8. You can adjust the scale if you want to, but it doesn't really matter. Okay. So let's draw the graph here. So it goes uphill, downhill, kind of passes through really flat, and then like that. Okay, you're not even finding the points of inflection, you're just counting how many. This is a graph of f prime of x. What feature will I be looking at for points of inflection? Um, Keep in mind the inflection when the slope changes, when the slope changes yeah. is correct. Because remember, points of inflection are the second derivative. So if this is already the first derivative, then the second derivative is the slope. Yes, of this graph. 
Okay, and I'll usually put X's to show where my POIs are. So at the beginning, we're uphill, but then we have a turning point. That's your first point of inflection. Then it's downhill until you hit that point. Okay, now should this count? Yes. Okay, it's actually going to be no. Here's why it's uphill, it flattens out, but then what? Still up. That doesn't count as a slope changing sign. Okay, it does kind of flatten out, so that's a horizontal tangent, but it doesn't count. Then we do have one more change up here and one more change down here. So your total number of points of inflection would be four. Um, different question How many extrema do you have? Meaning mins and maxes. Where would you find the mins and maxes on an F prime graph? Just four. But what are oh, your wait, mins and maxes? Because there's actually two. Because it's on the, the x axis. Right? Yes, but there should be three still, right? One, two, three. On the middle? Uh huh. Because it does it pass through the x axis from negatives into positives? So it doesn't count as a point of inflection because the slope doesn't change sign, but it would count as what type, min or max? A, uh, min. min. This one would be a min. Oh, yeah. That's a min. But then, yeah, these two would both be maxes. Does that make sense? So just kind of be careful about it. If you're looking at F prime, mins and maxes are on the X axis. Dab on them. Okay. And then um, what would you have to do differently on the next question? Uh, find it. You have to find the derivative yourself. Now, do we remember the derivative of cosine? Okay, it's going to go to negative sine. And then what do I do with the 2x? But then times by? Two. Oh, channel. Uh-huh, channel. So, so cosine goes to negative sine. Cos and the 2x stays the same, but then an extra times 2 at the back. What's the derivative of ln 3x? One over three. One over three X and then times three. Do you remember that? So if you want to put over here to the side, derivative ln X is one over e, one over X. So if it's one over three X, you'd still have to times by a three X because you have like a, a three in the middle. Okay, so let's put that into our calculator and then we're looking for concavity changes. So it's going to be negative 2 sine 2x. You can put the 2 at the back if you like that better. It really doesn't matter. Okay, so type that in. Plus. And then for the 3 and the 1 over 3x, let's just make that one fraction. Where would I times the 3 in if I wanted to use the fancy fraction? Where would the 3 belong? On the top. On the top. Very good. So 3 times 1 is 3 over 3x. You could just do one over x because the three is in front of that's true. Okay, then from there, we're looking for the graph to change concavity. Okay, but this is f prime. So what feature will we actually be looking to change? Um, We'd be looking for the slope to change sign. Very good. And so looking at that graph, it looks like it changes slope twice. Now, last time it only asked you to count. This time you actually have to find it. So if I wanted to find, let's say this one right here, what second trace would I pick? Okay, oh. two will give me where it hits the x-axis. I want this low point right here. So I'm finding a min, that's right. So second trace, pick the minimum. And then remember, you're going to have to, for the left bound, be a little bit on the left. So I'm going to be kind of like right here. And then for the right bound, I'm going to have to totally round the hump to be on the other side of it so that I can trap that minimum value in the middle. And then for the guess, just kind of go back towards where you think the bottom is. Okay, also remember the calculator will give you the X and the Y. You should be writing down the X. So I got but, 0.93. Is that answer there? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. I was looking at the wrong choices. 
Okay, so are we, uh, now what would we be looking for? Let's say you wanted to find this one instead. What would you pick instead of second trace min? Max. Second trace max. So you do option four. And then when you do your left and right, you'll have to kind of scroll through the asymptote, which is kind of annoying, but eventually you'll pop up on the other side. And then remember, you have to be on the left side of the hump and then cross over to the right side of the hump and then go back to the middle. And then go back to the middle, like that. So your other point of inflection would be at negative 0.93. Um, all right, next one says we have a velocity graph and they asked me for acceleration. What do I do? <coughs> okay, yes. Take if the I take the derivative because velocity to acceleration is down. Okay, and remember, don't do this by hand at all. You're just going to type it into the calculator, find the derivative of the calculator. Okay, there are two ways for you to do that. Either way, you're going to start by typing your equation in here. So 3 plus 4.1 cosine 0.9x. Okay, remember the x and the t are interchangeable. Okay, the easiest way, I think, is on your home screen. You're going to hit second, quit, after you type it in, and then math 8. So math eight, and then you should have a ddx. Remember math nine does an integral. That's not what we want. Okay, what goes in the bottom blank? X. X, what goes in the big box? X. Y one, yeah, which we already typed in, or you could retype it into that box if you really wanted to. Wait, how do you do those in the uh, alpha, alpha trace? <laughs> And then I want to take the derivative at what time? Uh, four. Four. Then you'll put a four right there. And it gives you 1.63. Okay, so remember it's mass eight for a derivative. And then it's d, d blank, <coughs> blank. So you put d, d, x, y, one, and then the number you want the derivative at. Um, okay, next one. This one gives you acceleration, but they ask you to go back to velocity. Which direction then are we going for the second one? I have acceleration, but I want velocity. I'm doing an integral. Now remember for integrals, you have to have endpoints. So here's what you're going to do. When is the last time that I know the velocity? They have to give you the velocity at some point. So it's two at t. Okay, good. So I know that at time two, the velocity gives me, at time one, the velocity is two, right? So then all that I need to do is find out how much it moves from one to two. And then I can just add it to the original velocity. So I would say, okay, the velocity at time two is going to be two plus the integral from one to two of acceleration. So this is the amount that I was given. And then this is how much it would have changed until the time that I care about. And remember, when you integrate velocity, it tells you how much position change. Integrate acceleration, it tells you how much uh, velocity would have changed. So then for this one, I'm just going to type the whole thing in together. Two plus math nine. I want to go one to two. Natural log one plus two up to the T. DX, just like that. Okay, where the two is my starting value, and then this is how much it would have grown. So then my final position, you could say, or velocity would be 3.34, which is answer choice B. Does that all kind of make sense so far? Okay, we probably really have time for one more. Um, let's see, which one will we do? 
Um, let's do, uh, go down to this question. It's like one page over. Okay, it says H of X is shown above. So this is the original. And it says, which of these could be H prime? So let's say that A is the answer. If this is H prime of X, how many critical numbers do you have? One. One, and what type is it? Um, max. It is a max, very good. Look at your original. Does it only have one max? It has one min. It has one min and one max, right? So that's not gonna work. Now that also tells me how many intercepts do I need to see on the x-axis? I'm gonna need to see two. So that means B's out. C could be it, D could be it, E could be it. Now let's uh, see which one is the right type. If it was C, what would the first intersection be? A min or max? A min. And does the original graph of F have the min come first? Yes. Uh, what does this have first? The original has the max first, and then it hits the min second, right? Because this is the original graph I'm trying to match. So then I can't pick C because it hits them in the wrong order. So that leaves us then with two. They both have the same x-intercepts. So just look at the ends of the graph for E the ends of the graph keep going up versus for D, they're curving back towards zero. If your derivative is coming back to the x-axis, what would the original graph be doing? Would it be getting steeper or flattening out? Steeper. If it's coming back to zero though, oh. it'd be flattening out. Because think about as it gets closer to the x-axis, it's flattening out to turn again up here. So is your original graph flattening out on the ends or is it continuing to get steeper? So then which one would it be? E. Yes. Make sense? Good job. Good for you. Now have your sheets. Oh, and then I need you on the side now. 